Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. This is Charles from Channel Books on Stereo, and we're here to kick things off in like the new season or the new era of audiobooks for the win. And today I have an amazing interview from the one, the only, the Stella Hunter. Now, if you want chapter times or stuff like that, I'll leave them down in the description box as well, as well as I'll leave all of Stella's recommendations as well as all her social media links down in the description box as well. And without further ado, enjoy the interview. Hey guys, welcome back to my YouTube channel. This is Charles from Channel Books on Stereo, and I have probably one of the best romance narrators out there in the game right now i have the stella hunter and i first want to gush about your um upcoming audiobook big deck energy which is mm -hmm. written by kim lorraine aka mm -hmm. you also me. Don't, yeah. first of all people who don't know <laughs> yeah <laughs> but i absolutely adored it you can t i could tell in your performance you were having really a, a ton of fun while recording this book yeah yeah it was it was a blast and i think it was really funny because it started out as like a joke between me and Shane because, you know, he and I work together frequently. Mm -hmm. And at this point, we've, you know, we are friends. And so when he put out his, he was asking me about his merch that he has. And he was like, what do you think of Big Deck Energy? And I was like, that's hilarious. Because he has this whole in you know joke about about his deck being really big and it became a thing on twitter with him and joe arden when he was doing um a book for lauren blakely with joe arden and so then he started this merch and i he sent that to me and i was like oh that's very tongue-in-cheek i think it's really funny and then i reached out to him uh, maybe the next day and i was like so what do you think about me writing a book with the title big deck energy how would you feel about that? And he was just like, and I was like, and you could narrate it. We could do it together. And, uh, you know, we have this British hero. What do you think? And he was just like, I'm for it. <laughs> and, then, and then it was supposed to just be a little novella. And then it turned into a book. And and that's how Ethan Byrne was born. <laughs> and like the other characters you introduced in this world, I'm like, okay. Uh -huh. I was like, uh -huh. I like him. Like now I need all these books. I need them There's written a whole like hockey team. <laughs> I was like, you dropped too many names. I'm like, okay, these are like this is like five books right here alone. Mm -hmm. Well, it was like this accent buffet for mm -hmm. Shane to do because you know when when I when you know who your character is going to be narrated by, it gives you this freedom to say, okay, well, I know you're good at this one. I know you're good at this one. I know you're good at that one. So I have all this freedom to be like, all right. So that gives Here's me <laughs> this guy and this guy, and it's going to be delicious to listen to. And we just had such a blast. And I think, you know, over my t two years now of narrating, he has been a big part of, like, encouraging me and supporting me and in, in building my um, repertoire. And I think that because we have this camaraderie, it was so much fun to write this book and know that like he's going to have a lot of fun doing this, mm -hmm. you know, and he's and it's not going to be like a, a weird feeling of, oh, she wrote this thinking about me. It's more like, oh, she wrote this because she knows we're going to have fun doing it. Yeah. And we and we did. We had so much fun. We were laughing. We were, um, you know, spending we spent two days together on zoom in the booth and recording back and forth and all those text messages and the banter and stuff. We just had, it was a great time. I feel like mm -hmm. you're like the queen of duet narration. Now I'm kind of like <laughs> mad. I'm like, oh, this is only dual narration. Like, come on, <laughs> give me a duet. <laughs> you have spoiled you know, me for the audio books. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, duet for me as a listener is my favorite. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not to say that there aren't so many really wonderful dual or solo narrated books because there are and I as a narrator love doing dual or solo because when you do solo you get like full you know you get carte blanche you can just you can you make those anything. characters completely your own you don't have to confer with anybody about like well I'm gonna do this guy with a southern accent and then your male narrator's like but I did him with a Canadian accent you know like you don't have that happen that doesn't happen <laughs> but like you know, it is it is nice to have, like, all your choices that you get to make. I remember doing Tramp by Mary Elizabeth. And it. it's a book that just sticks with me. Like, a lot of the time, 
I, I enjoy them all as I'm doing them, but then I don't have space in my brain for everything, you know? So they kind of, I, I move on. Like I have to move on and I can recall them if I bring them up and think about them, but there are some mm -hmm. books where they just stick with you and tramp. I cannot forget Lydia and talent ever. I love them. I'm just, like, I love them. And, uh, that one might got to do solo and she was such a cool character, but there was like this big cast of people and I got to play with all these voices and, you know, do things that challenged me. And so that was fun too. So I think there's two sides to the coin with duet versus dual or solo. I guess like in my first question too is um, what made you decide to make that transition or addition, I should say, from author to narrator? Were you always interested in uh, narrating audiobooks? Yeah. So, I mean, I've, I've always been in, like, I've always been involved in theater. I was an opera major in college. I, so I've been on, you know, I've been on stage. It's, that's not new to me. Performing is not new to me. I've always been a performer. And I think it was like, I started consuming audiobooks as, a, as my preferred media for reading when we lived in Japan and I was home with, you know, two small children, one of whom was in school, the other who was a, you know, three-year-old terror. And I couldn't sit and read anymore. So I started listening. And then I became just a listener, like a hardcore listener all the time. And I remember very quickly realizing how important performance was in the audio. Mm -hmm. And so if it wasn't a good performance, I couldn't listen to it. So I was already latched onto that. And I already felt like, gosh, these audiobook narrators are so talented. It's such an amazing thing that they can do. And I never thought I could do it. It wasn't something that was on my radar until we started the podcast, Audibly Addicted. And Mo and I were interviewing authors and narrators, and we were talking just about audios we loved. And, you know, it was this, this growth of our love of audiobooks into relationships with narrators and relationships with other authors. And then I kept getting emails from people asking if I would narrate for, like, if, if I would ever narrate a book. And I was like, no, <laughs> you don't want to listen to me. Why would you want to listen of to me? My do. voice is annoying. You don't want to listen to me. So it was uh, kind of that spurred it a little bit. And then I was talking with um, with Teddy Hamilton, and he was like, you know, you have a really good romance voice. And I, he said, I was listening to the podcast we did, and I was thinking, God, she should be a, a narrator. And I was just like, really? Okay. And so then I went and I got coaching, and I reached out to Erin Spencer, and she helped me, and she... You know, I, I told her, can we just do this so I can like see if if you think that this is something I should do? And because I'm a person who needs validation. <laughs> it's just how I exist. Yeah. And so once I talked to her, it just kind of became this like, yeah, I, I think you can do it. I worked on it with with coaches and I practiced a lot. And I first started with one of my own books because I wasn't going to test out my ability on somebody else mm -hmm. so I did saddle up and that was my very first audiobook and um the reviews were were good it did really well but I did go back and redo it with Aaron and we did it duet style afterward because I personally wanted to make sure all my books were duet and that one wasn't and I personally was like I don't like that performance so I'd like to redo it and uh that's not something most narrators get to do. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, usually it's like, do it and then just keep going. <laughs> so that's that's kind of my journey. And it was, it's a very unusual journey. I think a lot of people, um, you know, it takes a longer uh, path to get to where mm -hmm. I am with my library of works. But it is a lot of auditioning. It's um, certainly having a production company. And being able to audition for books I think I would be right for, that's important. That has helped me because it gives me access to audition material. Um, so, you know, there's definitely some of that because 
if I if I do think I'm good for a book, I will audition for it, just like you would anything else. Um, I don't tell the authors ahead of time that it's me because I don't mm. want them to feel at all like obligated. So when I audition, I just submit, you know, who we, we usually pull like a list of three females, three males, depending on, you know, of course, like if it's a female, female book, then we would do probably a, a list of like six female narrators so that they would have choices because I think choices are very important. And I think, um, you know, offering people who fit within the archetype of the character the voice type of the character is really, really important. So if I do offer myself, I don't call it out that it's me. I just do the same for everybody and just wait for them to make a decision. That's amazing. Cause like I do, like the more you listen to audiobooks, you get a sense like the right pairings between authors and narrators. Like when you mm -hmm. find like Cressley Cole has Derek, no, um, Oh, Robert Petkoff. Robert oh. Petkoff. And like, I, I couldn't imagine anyone else narrating no. any of her books. Cause like he just no. gets, her heroes, he, her heroines, her writing. Everybody. He's amazing. Like amazing. There's like yep. some narrators mm -hmm. and author pairings that just work. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. just get their dot. Because I think so much, I always think like a a great book is always elevated by an audiobook. Or sometimes oh, yeah. they can take it to a next level. And then also, how <laughs> does it um, audibly addicted your production company? Because I think that's something relatively new that I've seen in audiobook space. We see more... Um, independent audiobook production mm -hmm. companies other than audible yeah. like pink yeah. flamingo yeah. Yep. Luna's uh, when audio I stand. Yeah. when i stand yep. that are yep. taking more indie titles that mm -hmm. probably wouldn't mm -hmm. have been put by put on an audio like a podium as well that would yeah, be put on, I, au on audio so like how did yours kind of come about um so that is it stemmed from the podcast again you know we built mm -hmm. those relationships and um we are so lucky because we had these narrators who already had such a large body of work who took a chance, let you know, with us like dipping mm -hmm. our toe into the water. Um, but it really started with my uh author friend Nicole French, and she came to me and she said, I want you to produce my audiobooks. And I was like, I am not a producer. And then she was like, but you are, you really are because you already, like I produced on my own, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, and then like Geneva Lee had her Royal series, uh, where she did the, the new ones and it was Shane East and Kylie Stewart. And I remember like talking with her about that. And I was very like, I'm going to give advice to authors when they ask me about how to produce your own audio, because I do it. And I also know a lot about what I like as a listener. So I'll share that information. And, you know, every every author's experience is different and every listener's experience is different. But it, I do think that, you know, at this point, I am a pretty discerning listener. So my input was welcome there when people were asking me for stuff. And so people started asking me casting advice and things like that. And so that's where it kind of was born when Nicole was like, I want you to produce these. What would you charge me to produce these? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure. I don't know the going rate. And so we started with that and we did her series, um, which are narrated by Wen Ross and Kai Kennicott. And the first one is called The Scarlet Knight, I believe. And um, it's a prequel. And then there are three books in that series. And it was duet narration. And it was just this whole new thing. But the goal was for her, like, I don't want to have to proof my books. I don't want to have to handle any of it. I, I would like you to handle it. And I will pay you for that because I don't have time. And I'm very familiar with that. <laughs> You know, I have things right. that I also say, you know what, I'm going to hire this out because I don't have time to do it. So that's how it started was there. I mean, Nicole French was very, very helpful with pushing me toward doing something and and taking the knowledge that I had and and helping other authors, because that's the goal for me is like mm -hmm. you want to help the authors to one, not not completely break the bank because it's expensive. Um, to make wise casting choices and three produce good quality audiobooks. Yes. Because you know, listeners are discerning, they have standards, they will hear it if you're 
you know, recording in your bathroom. I think also it's very subjective. Audio quality is not subjective, but mm -hmm. the narrator, it's subjective. Some voices tickle people's ears and some don't. And that's okay. Like, I'm not for everybody. I know that. I've seen some reviews where... <laughs> oh, you're amazing. It's just like, <laughs> don't listen to those negative reviews. I just like, stopped. I, actually, I stopped reading them. <laughs> like, I found so many amazing authors because I just said, oh, Stella Hunter narrates. Okay, well, of course I buy it. Mm. I don't, like, I just don't even listen. Aww. Like, if I know the narrator or I know mm -hmm. of the narrator or they're paired with mm -hmm. someone I do know, I just, like... Because the quality has gone up, especially so much for the indie title like yeah. audio books that mm -hmm. just rival mm -hmm. what you're seeing yeah. in the um, traditional public space. And I love that you have your own production company kind of breaking up the audible monolith that yeah. Audible has on audiobooks. Yeah. Cause like for, mm -hmm. for at least the past couple of years, Audible was like the dominant. Like yeah, you, I think they had they a were like buying. Hole. Yeah. They were buying a lot of rights and they were producing a lot of audio and you know, we don't buy the rights. Like we just, we're just there to help you produce your book. Mm -hmm. you own you you hold all your rights um i i think that's super important from the author perspective is to hold mm -hmm. on to your rights because those are yours and if you don't have to give it up you should keep the money you know like you mm -hmm. keep it um but i think that you know there's a lot that these production companies you know lyric audio uh one night stand pink flamingo blue nose audio i am positive there are more and i'm sorry if i'm forgetting you uh, the audio flow um mm -hmm. you know these are these are all groups of people who are there to help authors produce an audiobook that's going to be good quality and to help them and like pink flamingo i know buys rights and they do um publish as well as help produce mm -hmm. And uh, I think possibly audio flow does that. I don't know. I could be speaking out of turn, but they're also doing a lot like um, audio flow is doing a lot to help. Um, and so is lyric audio to amplify um, um, authors of color and narrators of color, which is super important because that is something that has been over the, you know, since the beginning of audiobooks is not something that's been as as uh, in the forefront about casting with representation. And so now, you know, they've got their um, their audio in color is something that I believe it is Lyric Audio who's doing. And they're highlighting with like grants for um, authors of color to get their work in audio, which is amazing. You know, I think these mm -hmm. these smaller companies are able to focus on good good works and good things to do for the community. So yeah, I'm I'm very grateful that we're part of the community. Audiobook people like don't even if you say there's no audiobook, they don't want to hear. <laughs> no, I mean audio listeners are very, very loyal if they know that you're going to give them consistent audiobooks. And I think that's really important. And uh I think like advanced listener copies, you know, giving those out if you're able to is so great because you don't want your your audio people to feel that they are left out, you know, like they're just as important. But it's just that it's a different audience, mm -hmm. you know, like because a lot of audio listeners are exclusive listeners, some mm -hmm. because they want to, some because that's the only way they can consume the book. And um, so it's really nice when you see authors who are committed to that, like Claudia Bergoa is so committed to audiobooks and we've produced a ton of titles for her she also works with one night stand studios and i've narrated for her and she is just very committed to like i want my books in audio because i want people to be able to have access to it so yeah and i wanted to get your um opinions on this subject i've seen it it was very popular on twitter a couple months ago, I forgot what news outlet published an article saying that artificial text-to-speech mm -hmm. narration will soon supplant or like challenge a rival audio, like human narrators. Like, what is your thoughts? Like, I don't agree with it at all. If anyone yeah. has listened to text-to-speech, I have so many times I had to restart a book mm -hmm. numerous times because I just checked out because it's like all yeah. monotone. I think. Well, I think the truth is that technology is always growing and it's very fast to um, to morph and change 
And there have been AI things that I've heard that do sound like a real human. And um, that right now when I hear it, sometimes on TikTok, there will be videos that I watch that are they're narrated. And it's not like the voiceover where they put the text and it reads the captions. Mm-hmm. It's like a it's a voiceover that sounds like a real human. But there's something just slightly off with the speech pattern, just off enough that as you're listening, you're like a little bit unnerved and you're just kind of like, what is what is happening here that is off? I don't think a non-discerning listener would know the difference, honestly, but I think somebody who listens all the time to voices and performances is going to hear it and go, this is, what's weird here? Something's weird. I firmly believe it's a hundred percent true that AI could completely put us all out of work. I, it's a healthy fear that I have that that could happen because I've invested in this career and I love this career. I love performing people's books. Specifically, I love performing romances because it's such um such an emotional experience every time you know you're you're going on someone's journey of falling in love and losing their love and finding them again and you know learning about themselves and you get to ride that wave and go on it with them that doesn't mean that i'm the only person that could do it it doesn't mean i couldn't be replaced by a computer I think that it's really important that listeners, that authors, that publishers, that unions stand up for voice artists, for for voice actors and narrators and say, humans are more important than saving money. Because that's where this is from, you know, and I I will offer no apologies. (laughs) This is to save money. This is to stop spending money on making audiobooks, which is in turn putting hardworking, talented people out of jobs. And I think that we all need to think about that, which I know it sounds preachy, but there are things you should preach about. And wiping out an entire um, group of talented humans and making their job obsolete is something we should be worried about. Not just we, the actors, but we as a society, you know, like we, why would we want to replace humans doing jobs that are challenging and fulfilling and enriching to our lives? Because it is like, Mm -hmm. it's, it's an escape. Like when I need to escape, I put on an audio book. I listen to one of my favorite narrators and I let them take me away. You know, I say, Aaron Mellon, can you please be my friend for a little while in my ears while I deal with whatever I'm dealing with? I don't want a computer doing that. You know, I want a human voice. So I think it's really up to to us, especially not even just the consumer. I think the consumer is so important because if if the consumer doesn't purchase an AI narrated book or returns the AI narrated book or badly reviews it. That says a lot. But I think that the authors who have the choice need to be the ones who say, no, Mm -hmm. like I'm, I'm firmly supporting the actors who bring these books to life. And to switch gears a little bit, I want to talk Mm -hmm. about what is your normal, like, I guess you call it proofing process. So like when you Get them after you audition and you know you're going to be recording a book. What does your mm-hmm. typical process look like from before you get into the booth, during the booth, and then after? Oh, once you're like done my recording? Pre- yeah, so my mm-hmm. whole. Um, so typically, what happens is I get booked for the title very far in advance at this point. Like, um, you know, when I was first starting out and it was starting to take off, it was more like a month ahead or so I would get booked. Now I have books that I have booked all the way into next year, you know, oh, that, wow. so, um, so then your schedule is very different because you know, you've got these, you know, things on your schedule and you kind of budget for time based on the word count of the book or the projected word count. Um, so I like to get the, the script 
a couple weeks before if possible just so I can read through it. And I don't do a deep, deep read of the book because I am a very instinctive performer and I need it to be really fresh um, in order to really connect with the character. I've just learned that about myself. Everybody's process mm -hmm. is different and there's not a right or wrong way. Um, personally, I think. So I'll read through the book, skim through it, get the basic idea of what's happening. I always ask the author to provide me with a, a character sheet with information about names, ages, vo voice types, you know, like if they have a specific, mm -hmm. um, I want this guy to be real grumpy and grouchy and gruff. You know, I want this girl to be very bubbly and light. Um, I need to know those things because it helps me. Um, sometimes they give me stuff like comps um, for actors or people on mm -hmm. TV shows, you know, characters on shows. Uh, like I tend to use like, um, this guy's really like, think, uh, Dean Winchester from Supernatural, you know, like kind of that, like surly, but still playful. That's sort of, you know, you go with, with that sort of, um, comp for somebody to help them inform their choices. And then accents are super important. Like if you have accents in your book, please tell your narrator, <laughs> tell them ahead of time. <laughs> So we don't get to the end and have, he said in his thick Russian accent. And then you're like, and wait, you what? To, and you have to go back and redo it. So, um, and then pronunciations and stuff. Like, that's important for me. If there's other, if there's language stuff, it's nice for me to at least know it's coming. Um, I still, as I'm recording, if I come up to like, I did a book recently that had a lot of German in it. I knew the German was coming. But I can't be overly prepared with that. Like, I don't have the ability to, like, pull clips of it. I probably I could figure out how to do that. But I'll pull up my website that I researched that on. And then I can get to the phrase, put it in, listen to it a few times, say it, say it, say it, then record the line and make sure that it sounds good. Um that's all stuff that you have to do as you're prepping. I think it's super important to at least give your manuscript one cursory read through. Again, it does not have to be cover to cover with a deep read of the book. It has to be, you've got to know what's going to happen You because it's got to inform how you're going to play things. Mm -hmm. Um. I also think it's really important that you're connected to your material as you're as you're performing it, because if you're not connected to it, then it shows you can hear it mm -hmm. in your performance. So so I'll do like my prep. Usually it's the day before, because if I do it too soon, then I, you know, forget everything. And and then my day is um, I don't start recording until late. In the, in the day because it's I've got, you know, three kids home and doing other things. So I usually start around 7 p.m. And then I record until 10 or 11 and try to get two finished hours in that time and uh, pray that my stomach isn't noisy and, <laughs> and that I don't make lots of mistakes. <laughs> so <laughs> so that's, that's kind of the process. I think it usually takes me, you know, two to three days to record depending on the length of the book. And um, when I am recording, every time I have a new character show up, I will take a clip of their voice and put it in the clipboard on my program so that I can reference them again later when they show up again and hear what their voice sounded like. Um, but yeah, other than that, it's really like I'm in here and I'm performing the book and oh. yeah, trying not to, mess up it doesn't just stop with the narrator so you know the narrator gets the book they do the book in a couple of days but then the editor engineer has to go through all of that and clean it up so um you know that can take much more time because it's listening for noises uh, marking when there's a mistake uh, making sure everything is there making sure that um you didn't mispronounce things you know all of that so so the engineer does it and then a prover listens to it and then you get your corrections you have to do your corrections sometimes you get a ton sometimes you get you know five 
sometimes, you know, we love it when we get five, <laughs> but you know, usually, usually it's like 20 or 30 corrections that you have to record. And then the editor has to go in and put those in and then they got to make sure it's going to meet audible standards. So it definitely takes time. I would say we always ask for a minimum of four weeks from the time you give us the manuscript to the time you get your final files. So at least a month to make sure that it goes through all the checks and that it's, you know, quality production material. Um, because there are also things that can delay recording. You get sick. Um, you Your neighbor decides that they're going to have a new roof put on. You know, I mean, like all of that stuff. is. In my case, it's my neighbor who gets out his wood chipper and starts going to town for hours you know and so i think that it's it's always going to take longer than you think it will one to to record but two to get the process done and so you want to always allow if you're trying to like get a pre-order for your book and make sure it goes live on a certain day you want to allow eight weeks at least from the time you give the manuscript to the time you want that book live and do you typically find like um because it Normally, so you said it takes like two to three days to record a book. So, like, mm -hmm. do you are like, could you have like in one situation you're recording, you moved on from another book and you're recording mm -hmm. a new book and you still have to do pick up and corrections oh, yeah. while you're doing another book? Yes, yeah, normal? I did that yesterday. Do you find that difficult yeah. to juggle no. because, like, to like flip between two different books? It can, it can be, but I think the corrections are such a different process and they take, um, they don't take as much time. But like, for instance, yesterday, I was doing corrections for Locked Up Liars by L. Thorpe. Um, and then I was also doing corrections for The Plan. And then I also was finishing recording Deviant Princess by Tracy Lorraine. Mm -hmm. So I had, you know, like, look at your, <laughs> your face. <laughs> that was a happy is, face. I, lo I love Tracy Lorraine, like. I love Tracy Lorraine. Found her because of you. And I'm like, dang you, Stella. Now I I'm hooked. Her. I love her. <laughs> yeah. I'm and hooked. I think it, well, yeah. So Deviant, Deviant Night should be out any day. And then Deviant Princess, I just finished. And then I start Deviant Rain uh, next week. So, but it's like, that's really different because you go from the plan and Locked Up Liars are American women, but in Deviant, princess i'm you know like this rough london girl so the accent has to change <laughs> so that's a little tricky at times you have to really settle into it and her accent is uh different from my normal british that i do you know which is that more uh not necessarily posh but maybe a little more upper class british and uh so yeah i have to put myself in a real different mindset <laughs> when I'm Emmy. And um, I know you do a lot of duet narration. So mm -hmm. how does that change the recording process? Or do you usually have them in booth while not you're recording all, no. duet style? Yeah, it's not usually connected. Um, I tend to, when it's my own book, because it's a different process for me. Um, but it's it can be very cost prohibitive to do it that way. Um, because everybody has to be paid for their time that they're working, you know, cause that's fair. Like you have to pay everybody if they're, if they're recording together, they should be paid for the time that they're together. Um, so I have some of those where I have done those specifically, uh, the ones I do with Shane, um, we are in booth together. Um, we work really well that way and we love it. It's a lot of fun. And we just finished, um, recently two pretty lies by kl claire mm -hmm. and that one we recorded over zoom and it was a super fun experience and it's an age gap and like it's great he's like a bodyguard i have to stay away from like when you do it with shane and i'm like oh. I'm like, Stella, I already have enough books I need to listen to you. <laughs> I, I just need to like block out yep. like your, your yep. guys' Twitter or when you post quit, like post quit. Uh, yeah. I'm like, yeah. I, can't, I can't listen because if I listen, I'm going to want to buy it and listen to it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think that um, when you do do it and you're not together, some people, it's always more fun to do it together <laughs> because you're acting 
with each other, especially if you're somebody who has a theater background or a screen, you know, film or TV background, because you're used to working with a partner and sharing a scene with somebody. So I love it. Aside from the fact that it can be challenging to schedule, I love it so much. However, doing it separately is also just fine. And the thing that we do is like I mark the audio with two snaps. Some people use like a click of a pen. Some people use a dog clicker. And you just mark it where the other person's lines are supposed to go. And then that person's recorded their line. So it's really all on the engineer. If the engineer is very good at their job, then they will make it sound seamless and it will be beautiful. As long as the audio quality of both people is up to snuff. You know, like it, it's got to be <laughs> like that has to be similar enough that you can balance them. If, you know, if you got one person recording in something that sounds like a tin can and the other recording in a booth, it's not going to work. Um, so... You know, the sound is too different. There's just no way. But I think that it's a really cool process. It's very different. And it can be challenging because it does break up the momentum of the scene because you're not getting the reaction, you know. Um, and so when you're doing dual, you're the person. So you're getting that. So what I do is I tend to just read the line in my head and in you know the, in my head of like how they would say it yeah and i feel like this is um this is a very fun question I'm, i want to hear your opinions so i know okay. you do a lot of duet with shane mm -hmm. but who mm -hmm. will be like a, a dream partner that you want to narrate more with instead of your duets with shane oh you're so mean to me <laughs> it's okay well I'll, I'll edit this clip out and post it to shane, <laughs> to shane just send it to, just send it to him like she's abandoned you. Um. Oh. So you do you mean on Zoom? Or Zoom, or like um, if you had another like I know you did with J. F. Harding, would you mm -hmm. swap I loved him in for Shane or Teddy I Hamilton? Love I love Teddy Hamilton. You're asking me. <laughs> <laughs> you must choose all one. of my my friends. Um. <laughs> so. If we're talking about doing Zooms with people, so I'm going to quantify this. <laughs> um, I loved Zooming with J.F. Harding. We had a blast together on The Baby Proposition. And I really just enjoy him. I would love to do more of those with him. Um, but I also... <sighs> Charles. <laughs> This is hard. Um, I just recently did some Zoom with Sebastian York, and he was just lovely. Uh, so I would love to work with him uh, in that capacity. I think um, it's it's just a very hard thing to to choose because also when you don't, I know I'm the worst, but like when you don't, I feel like I broke you with this question. You broke me. <laughs> I don't make me pick because I also love Aaron Shedlock so much and like we have so much fun together. Um, it's really fun to do duets with people that you understand how they're going to deliver things. Mm -hmm. uh, so like Teddy Hamilton and I have only done one duet together, I think. And I would love to do more with him because I, I love working with him. He's he's always so wonderful to work with. And but they all are so. This is a very unfair question. I <laughs> so I'm just gonna walk circles around it because I don't want to answer. Mm. I would love to do a duet with um, Emma Wilder. That's who I would like to duet with. Ooh, That's, yes, yeah, that would be interesting. An FF yes, like, sapphic, mm. maybe. Yeah, yeah, maybe so possibly okay. i would not say no i would never say no to that um i think that there's not enough sapphic romance out mm -hmm. there so you know um i but yeah i think she would be a fun person to duet with and i like multicast because then you get all the different talents that you get to be with you know you get to just like enjoy it all together yeah. um so and then you know james joseph He's, I really like him. His voice is mm -hmm. 
Beautiful. Have you you've listened to him? If you've listened to Tracy Lorraine, right? Or yeah, have you he not did, done um, her newest, the first book in the newest series, uh-huh. right? Yeah, the wicked. I can't remember the wicked, name. Wicked night. Wicked, wicked summer. Night. Night. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he yeah. was new to me. I was like, oh, okay. Maybe yeah, I'm adding he's... you to the list. Yes. Yeah. We we have been enjoying him. I've been working with him a lot, and I do really like working with him. Um, so Shane's a main so. squeeze, and then maybe James Joseph is. <laughs> <laughs> I won't. I won't make Shane, you choose. I'm just trying to squeeze. subtly like get you to agree. So like, confirmation. If Shane doesn't do a do a, with Stella, then here's it. Then here's the next partner in her mind. Oh, you're so mean to me. Um, my okay. So Br- British partner, my my <laughs> second main British partner squeeze <laughs> is James Joseph. <laughs> okay, and then we'll choose. Then you can choose an American one, and then we uh-huh. and then I can let you off the hook. God, <laughs> <sighs> this is like I'm under pressure. Um, I think probably at the moment, uh, JF Harding, okay. but this is under duress. I want to go on record. <laughs> <laughs> so, everyone just Can't like skip just that have... under duress part and then we just move under... on. <laughs> Listen, can't I just have? A, my own reverse harem of just voices that I get to narrate with. like. But that is a great segue why? into my next question. Any <laughs> upcoming projects or any you have, up, <sighs> any upcoming projects that you're really excited about? And then the other part to that question is, are there any audios that you have done or that you recently listened to that you really love that you would recommend? Mm. Okay. I have many upcoming projects. There are so many of them. Um, this has been my busiest two months that I've ever had. Um, Last Resort by Kay Bromberg is coming up. Um, that's in post-production right now, and that's me and Aaron Shedlock. Um, I worked on Hopelessly Bromantic, which is a full cast for Lauren Blakely. And um, I also obviously have The Mate Games, which is probably like my as an author um i wrote with meg ann and it is a four book series it's reverse harem it's multicast duet so i do get my reverse harem of voices but i don't have to choose between <laughs> see i i like i gave you a good i gave you, you a good segue good job. i made it up good to job. you even with a cameo from my main squeeze <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, that was um, that's probably like the biggest project I think because it is the main character, like the heroine, has the bulk of the all the books, and so um, we just put book one up, and it is a little over nine hours, and it is just it was a joy to listen to, and I don't even like to listen to myself, but they everyone did such a wonderful job. And we have James Joseph and we have J.F. Harding and we have Aaron Shedlock and we have Jason Clark. And um, and then we get a cameo from Shane East. And it's it's really, really fun. And it was um, produced by Audibly Addicted, but also edited by Tyler Whitlatch, who is just this like amazing wizard of audiobooks. Like he's so good at engineering audiobooks. And so we worked with him on that simply because one, I know he's wonderful, but two, um, I we were already so booked that I, I'm not going to take space. Like, mm-hmm. you know, my own audiobooks don't take space away from our clients. And mm-hmm. so I outsource that to people that I trust. But that is going to be such an experience. And we have our um, people who are our alpha readers who got to read as we were writing the books. They're listening to the first book right now as like a a thank you because of course you know they Mm -hmm. they put in a lot of um work devoting time to listen or read you know and give feedback and and make sure that we were on the right track and they are just enjoying it immensely so that's really great to hear so because you know anytime you do a full cast you you get we'll get you on you'll get an ALC. i'm waiting i'm like i'm eagerly like making room in my reading schedule yeah set aside nine hours (laughs) 
Hey. Nine hours to listen to book one. And then finally, <laughs> one final question. What is one mm-hmm. audiobook that you've been loving recently? It doesn't be an all-time favorite. It'd be one that mm. you did or someone else did. But what's one that you really, really love and you want to tell people to go check out? Oh. Okay. Well, I think it's very important to uh, to talk about two options <laughs> one that is one that i've done because okay you know okay so um i did bound by danger by meg ann with shane and we did a zoom duet and it is quinn and finley's story and it it was so much fun to do i do think that is one that should not be missed especially if you like paranormal um i second this Yes. So I feel like that is something that if you are a fan of the Stella Shane pairing, that's one you should listen to. Um, We did all the books in that series together and it's a really cool world. And I think that that is something that, you know, my biases because I love Meg so much aside. It is a really great story. I listened. I was on a JF Harding kick because that's what I do. Like I pick a narrator that I that it's making my ears happy and then I listen to a lot of things they've done I listened to it ain't me babe by Tilly Cole which is old like it's it's a long time ago and it have you listened to it I have oh my god so, <laughs> so, good. <laughs> so good. it's so good it's so good and I don't even like MC books very much because I have a little bit of a knee-jerk reaction to some of the language used when they're speaking to women and I, so I have a hard time with that and that's my own issues there's like nothing wrong with enjoying these books whatsoever um, it's just who I am and what bothers me um, but that book was so affecting in many many ways it's dark and the hero has a stutter and the performance is amazing on both sides. Both narrators are just do it beautifully. And I just really loved it. And I haven't been captivated by a book like that in a long time. So I'll leave all of Stella's links down below. So yes, you can go find you. her on her social media. And you mm-hmm. can keep abreast of like whatever she's posting. Sometimes she narrates from the booth on her Instagram and on TikTok. Mm-hmm. So definitely yep. go check her out. Mm-hmm. But thank you mm-hmm. again so much, Stella, for coming on my channel. You. You're now a two-peat guest. I know. As an author and now as a narrator. A case like people who don't know that. Thank you again, Stella, for so of much course. for coming on my channel. It has been a pleasure having, with, having you on my channel. And hope for everyone watching, you got to know a little bit more about the audiobook production process and how it is for narrators. Mm-hmm. But thank you guys again so much for watching this video and I'll catch you guys with a brand new video. Bye everyone.